Hello, everybody. I'm Trisha Gillette, and I'm an alcoholic. Hey, Keep an eye on the time. Oh, oh, wow. This is actually my first time outside of my home group sharing my story, so this is pretty neat that it got to be at this group. I uh, look up to several members in this group, and uh, it's a good, solid group, so I'm glad to be a part of it, and I'm glad to be here speaking for you guys share my story. Um, I'll start with my sobriety date is July 1st, 2019, and my home group now is A Vision for You in Fayetteville. I live in Fayetteville. Um, prior to that, I was actually part of There's a Solution uh, for two years with Susie, my sponsor, um, and they really, really showed me a good foundation of what a solid home group was and how to be a member. Um, so it was really important for me to be real close to my sponsor, uh, given my past. Uh, I just really wanted to uh, learn this way of life and learn how to apply it. Uh, so I'd like to start with, um, I was born and raised in Massachusetts. Um, I'm the oldest of eight. And uh, I can honestly say that I didn't have a good life. It was very... Um, a dangerous life, very abusive, alcohol, and all the other things involved um, on both sides of the family. That's like really all I knew. Um, it was a normal life. I would go to school with a smile on my face, but full of fear, uh, full of embarrassment, feeling like somebody knew what was going on at home. Um, I swore I would not be like my family. Um, that I was set out to do. Um, obviously, that didn't work. <laughs> um, gosh. I can also say that um, I did not grow up in any church. Uh, I didn't have any examples of what God would look like in someone's life. Um, no spiritual principles, no spirituality. Uh, not a word in the Bible. Um, I really honestly didn't have any role models growing up either. Um, I do truly feel that it was God that uh, not only got me to Alcoholics Anonymous and to recovery, um, but also uh, got me to him. Um, and, I, and I say that because I rem I'll never forget the day um, after a very serious tragedy of landing underneath the vehicle with my husband and uh, from my husband running me over we were intoxicated and, and other things in our system uh, fighting about who was going to take the kids to the bus um, and uh, of course you know when I drink I'm like superwoman and I think I can stop vehicles so I'm not standing here being any uh, uh, I was not being abused if anything, I was abusing him. Uh, I was a blackout drinker, and I did a lot of dangerous things, and it, it, it took me to places that I am to this very day very embarrassed about, um, fighting cops and whatnot. So that incident uh, obviously put me in the hospital. I had 11 broken bones and off go with my five children. Um, I remember seven days in that hospital and finally realizing that it was alcohol related and, and not to mention when they cut my clothes off, other things were hidden on me. By God's grace and mercy, they didn't charge me with anything because there was plenty to. Um, and I remember making a commitment to myself that I'll never drink again. That's it. And of course, I had a lot of driving force so that I lost my children, right? I thought for sure that I meant business and that was going to be the case, that I was never going to drink again. <clears throat> well, I walked out of the hospital with 11 broken bones and clinkety clink clink of the medication, and that ran out, and I started right back to drinking because uh, nothing was ever enough for me. Um, I had no clue of the depths of where I was in, in my alcoholism. Um, I would joke about, oh, I'm an alcoholic, as I would struggle over the years, but I really didn't even know what that meant. <clears throat> and um, a thought came to mind was, maybe it's because I can't 
uh, I don't believe in God is, and I believe that to be God because, like I said, I don't have any references, family, friends, or ever growing up and saying that looked nice. They lived a good life. Maybe I should do that. I didn't have that, so I do believe that that was God that put that thought in my head um, because I really didn't think there was a God. That's it. That was just where I stood with that. There is no God. There's so many religions which once telling the truth. Um, and so I found a church that I happened to be, uh, there was a pastor in the uh, outpatient treatment that I was recommended to be at or demanded to be at through DSS. <laughs> <laughs> demanded, that's, that's the truth, demanded um, by DSS. Um, still in an oblivion, having no understanding of my, what it is I'm going through. And I'm sure he just looked at me and this teacher of the class, and he happened to be a pastor, and he invited me to his church. He was just like, bless her heart. <laughs> <laughs> and it happened to be in Lumberton, and so I would drive out to Lumberton from Fayetteville, and, 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 and just, I was all in, that's it. It's this good, the God thing is going to be the answer. This is going to fix me. And, and I did. I was all in. I, I cooked for the church. I drove the van for the church. Uh, to pick people up in the surrounding cities. I worked with the children. Um, and and so I thought that the more part of, I would feel a part of. But at the end of the day, uh, I didn't understand. It was like gibberish. I didn't really feel. I was forcing myself to be a part of and never feeling a part of. And I uh, always felt like an outsider. And so the truth is what ended up happening and me realizing way after I didn't feel a part of because, you know, I was smoking those left-handed cigarettes before I went into church. And after seven months of trying this thing and look and realize I'm looking, I happen to have a watch at the time because I'll never forget this day. I'm thinking about when I can go drink when I was done. And something just lifted me off that chair. I know to be God today. And just I dropped to my knees and I said, if you're real, and that was my prayer. If you're real, please help me. Because six months, I'm in the same stuff. I did no change. I was just attending a church. I was manipula ma manipulating, lying uh, to all the people in my life and the social services. And, and I thought I was so cool, I was ready to be a drug counselor. <laughs> no wonder why the people in my rover Reese thought I was crazy. Because <laughs> I wouldn't shut up about that. <laughs> It's, God, just looking back, it's like, I was a joke. And, but that's that. Can't tell the difference between true and false. That, that was the place I was at. I was completely oblivious to my situation and my condition. And uh, so after that sincere prayer, and I remember my whole shirt was just soaking wet. I mean, I just poured with tears, and I was so broken, and I was just so hopeless, and I would not get off that floor. And I was just like, please help me. This is bigger than me. I want my kids back. I can't stop drinking and doing other things. Actually, I said drinking and using, okay? I say other things here, but that then when I was on my knees, I was saying drinking and using. Please help me. I can't stop. And... Um, Three days later, I was doing my no normal morning ritual, and I just, it came over me, like instantly. I just threw down what I was doing, and I looked at my husband at the time, and I said, that's it. And this is going to sound crazy. It's so simple, but it was not crazy to me at the time because the, the back story is, is I never had any friends or family go through detox or, or treatment or I ever heard of AA or NA or any 12-step program never existed in my life. And that thought was, I need to go to detox. Now, mind you, I didn't know what the point of a detox was. I didn't know. That's how blinded I was through the years. And even at that moment, once again, I see, I believe that all to be God. And uh, so in that very moment, uh, probably didn't help my case at all because it was originally for uh, domestic violence. But uh, I called up DSS, told them I had a problem, going to detox, going to get help. Um, I called my boss, who I was thought I was getting a drug and alcohol counseling job, um, a pastor. I just 
just had a list within minutes and called everybody. And of course, nobody was surprised, but I was sure shocked. And this was new news to me. This was a revelation. <laughs> like, seriously, it was. It's ridiculous to think about this sometimes. So my husband says, it's almost 4th of July week, and why don't you just wait? I said, no, <laughs> now. <laughs> I was serious. I really, I was convicted for the first time in my life. And uh, I four, I remember them saying they only had seven beds in Fayetteville, and I fought for seven days to try to get into detox. Um, and finally the woman says, like, I'm seeing you here every day at 7 o'clock. I'm going to go ahead and tell you a little secret. Don't tell anybody I told you. Basically a way to cheat the system, cut the line, and, and not keep being turned away. So I went into the hospital, and... Lo and behold, they don't think I'm bad off. They don't think I'm bad enough, and they were trying to send me out. Okay. I really had to fight for this first process and this journey of mine, let me tell you. Because uh, if I wasn't completely willing, I wouldn't even be probably here standing talking with you or even finding the program. At least that's what I think. And um, I said, no, I'm not leaving this hospital. I said, I, I said, all my family knows I'm here to get help. I said, I'm blacking out. I'm either going to kill someone or myself in a blackout. You know, that landed me in BAC. So. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't the mission. I mean, I was being sincere. I mean, I'm waking up with glass all over me. I'm either punching glasses and smashing cars and fighting my husband and so angry that I'm drinking again and again and again and breaking all the promises. And there was no light in any tunnel to see my children in that state. Um, and uh, I did seven days at BHC and they were detoxing me. And I remember getting on the phone fighting with my husband and something just washed over me, said, if you go home now, you're gonna do exactly the same thing. So I was scared. I was like thinking, what is all decades and seven days is not going to fix it? And I was like, God, if you're real, I don't know where I need to go and what I need to do, but I know I can't go home. And within three hours, I some I, and I didn't ask for it. I didn't know what to ask for once again. Uh, but I somewhere along the line pushed, hey, what else can I do? I can't go home. I'm afraid to go home. I'm going to drink and use again. And my River Reese was sitting across from me doing the paperwork, and in a few hours I was over at my River Reese. Um, the cool thing was is that, so I kind of blocked out, okay, the church thing don't work, right? I had seven months doing that. Of course, I didn't know all the factors that I was involving myself in, but in my mind, I was like, okay, well, the church thing just didn't work for me, and maybe it's not the God thing, but then, my release takes us to meetings and they talk about sponsorship. In my very first meeting, I remember hearing God. And I was like, oh. it was like the heavens just opened up. It went full circle like that from that very first thought and that journey just, it went full circle. But the difference was I did feel a part of here. You guys were talking like me, thinking like me, went through things like me. I didn't feel alone. And there was just like the world lifted off my chest. Like this was it. This is everything I've ever searched for my whole life here in Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, I thought that was going to be enough never ever to drink and use again. I just thought that's because I was now in AA and I had this conviction I'm never going to do it again. And so I would say all my journey was a bunch of knowledge and not really being fully honest. I would acquire some time. Um, in my eyes was substantial time, especially from where I went, came from, where a day was impossible, an hour was impossible. I was curling out of my skin. So um, it took me some time and some work with my current sponsor to realize how really unhonest I was over these years. Um, and it clearly says half measures avail us nothing. Um, I definitely wasn't practicing any principles in all my affairs. Uh, I wasn't sponsoring at one, my very first part of the journey. Um, but what I can say today is I finally got to that crossroad. Um, by God's grace and mercy, nothing tragic happened. 
Um, but I, I, there was a decision. And prior to was always to get my kids back, which the women warned me about that, that that wasn't going to keep me sober. Because once you get them back, what would be the point of coming back? Why would you come back, right? You got what you needed. And I was like, no way, that's not me. That's, I want to be here. They were right. It happened. That's exactly what happened. Um, once again, can't tell the difference between true and false. It's, this is a process that I have to live this way of life to really be able to come to some truths. And, and so I stand here before you realizing that I really just was on honest of, of that true decision when I say I was at that crossroad. You know, go on to the bitter end or accept spiritual help. And um, I kind of took Susie through a loop for the first 60 days. I was still trying to convince her and me. <laughs> well, I have a problem with the other stuff, <laughs> just not alcohol. <laughs> because on my last bout, I was able to pour drinks down the drain, and I only would have three. <laughs> <laughs> that was really miserable doing that, I will tell you. And I was out to set to think I can prove that I'm not. And it, it, if you don't have a problem, you those people don't even experience that trial and tribulation to have to prove to themselves and count drinks. <laughs> they don't have to negotiate with themselves. They don't know when they're going to take a drink again. Uh, they don't think about it. They don't plan it. <laughs> and unplan it. Because <laughs> I'm like, okay, we started, now we got to stop. And I was just, I didn't even, I'm like, I didn't even feel nothing. I was miserable. But for 60 days, I put it, I mean, I really made it. <laughs> I love her so much. She's really been very patient and tolerant and loving towards me in all my ways. And uh, with that, she has shown me a process of true recovery and what God's love is and what this program is about. And so she did amuse me. I remember us going through the, um, uh, essentially why we drink, and she had me fill in the blank with my other stuff since it wasn't alcohol. <laughs> and I was like, uh, looking back, realizing she knew what she was doing. <laughs> uh, we Once we proceeded and I continued to take those actions, um, I really started to... Uh, slowly but surely it not be because I'm going to get something out of this like my kids or my relationship or a better job like I would have all these materialistic things in the past of uh, painting this picture of why I need to stay sober it was never genuine I I need to I need and want to stay sober and so that's what that journey has looked like this past uh, over two years now is that um, I've, I have been through so much, um, some tragedy and some close calls, and um, but through going rigorously, honestly, and doing amends and working every single week with my sponsor, uh, so committed to the point where she suggested after my last vow, well, maybe you need to get a sponsor in Fayetteville. I said, well, how about I make my home group your home group, and I will drive there <laughs> twice a week going to home group, and then once a week, since we got to meet once a week to do book work, and you'll see me three and sometimes four times a week when we met at our tree meeting. And I stood to that for two years. I did that, and um, I was willing to go to any length because I, I, saw what, I saw her as an example. It wasn't things that she said. It was just what she does. She's doing exactly what that book uh, was teaching us and showing us to do, and so I am a visual learner. Not a, I'm not good with the reading and comprehension thing. Um, it's gotten better because of AA, actually. Um, but she shows me and, and all the home group members and just what that all looks like. Um, so, uh, so getting through all the steps, um, with, I would say, honestly, through sponsoring, this has been my first time I actually get to listen to um, a fifth step and gone through the whole 12 steps with another individual. And let me tell you, that was some rocket fuel in my recovery. I loved that. And I didn't have any sense or idea or thought that I did something for this person. 
And see, Susie has continued to, and when I would just thank her up and down, and what she says, no, that, you know, that's God. God's the one that comes in through her, gives her the strength. She stays connected with her God. And, and so that's what I try to uh, remember, that this is not of me, and that I didn't get sober for me either. It was to help that sick and suffering alcoholic. Um, and the only way that I can do that, and I had an aha moment, is um, I thought in the very last uh, part of the um, step 12 on 164, where it says you cannot transmit something that you don't have. And for the longest time, I just thought that was doing your step work. And when I say doing your step work, all my beginning process, it looked like a checklist. I just did it. Check, check, next, next, next. <coughs> I never got the understanding and the concept of, or was honest enough to say this was going to be learning how to understand those steps to, as a way of life. And so once I transformed to that, and I asked her one day, because I realized, okay, that steps is not a checklist here, and she described to me something that just seemed so memorable for me, and this has, because what she shared with me was, it had pushed me into genuinely, truly, truly doing my step work, applying my step work in my life. And so what she shared with me was, um, if I'm blocked and I'm not doing inventory, or I didn't do that original four step house cleaning, and then that continuous, um, and that prayer and meditation and building that relationship with God, and I had all this junk inside of me, what in the world are you possibly going to transmit to any newcomer? They're not going to want what you have. You know, there's going to be something blocking you. God can't come in and through you. And so because of that conversation, I was like, ah, oh, all right, I'm going to really, really do this step work. Like, not just say I'm doing it. Or say, I've done it. There's no done. And, and, and so uh, that, that made some big transitions, that, that moment. Um, and I often think about that because that's where um, I'll check in with myself and, and see where I'm at. Another helpful thing is where uh, she told me to go to page 52 and there's questions there and that's a way for me to do like a weekly check on my spiritual condition. You know, was I having trouble with relationship? Do I feel unhappy? Am I depressed? Am I misery and pray to depression? And, and several other questions and um, I can honestly say I can't remember. I have situations I've come across and things I've been through. Um, it's almost like that stuff isn't existent uh, because I immediately pray, I immediately call my sponsor, I ask for help, I'm always looking for someone to help. Um, and uh, I would say very strong tool of mine is my meditation. It's morning and night. I can honestly say that if it wasn't for my meditation and me, I find that as being building that relationship with God and Trisha doesn't know how to sit still and, and, and not be so hyper. And, um, but through the years of practicing that, it has changed this ADHD person. I can't do it. Five minutes is impossible. Well, I'll tell you something right now. I can sit there for hours and it, it's no thought process. There's no thought process of, oh, I gotta go meditate. I have to do this. Like it's just been a working part of my mind. It's just like as if I'm holding. If I were to run out of the house, not go to the bathroom, how uncomfortable would that be all day? <laughs> That's how I feel. And that was, I would say, in the first six months of this time, I would experience some times like that. After that, it has literally become a working part of my mind. It's, it's been the biggest, most valuable necessity of my life today. Um, honestly, I would say the loss of my children was parallel to me almost losing my mom being in Chapel Hill. And I was on the phone with my sponsor and I was going to meetings in Chapel Hill and I was praying and, and I did everything that was guided for me to be of service and show up. and. 
And I'm sitting there with my daughter, and I was like, well, not one thought of a drug or a drink came to my mind. And that was a miracle because my last bout was poor me. My adoption of my children went through, and I was supposed to be able to see my kids, boo-hoo, and now they won't let me see them. And I used that as an excuse. Instead of calling my sponsor, instead of praying, instead of going to look for someone to help, instead of going to a meeting, and so for me, that was essential that I went through that. The point was is that I persevered, came back, and, and worked with a sponsor and humbled myself that I really don't know anything and that I needed to be shown um, this way of life because it's not a way of life that I lived. I'm not familiar with it. And there are good days and bad days. Um, I can honestly say that through sponsoring other women, because for a long time I treated sponsorship like AA the rest of my life. So if I didn't feel like I wanted or needed to drink or other things that they weren't going to hear from me, everything was A-OK. -okay. And through these last two years, I've learned through all our sharing and, and walking this path shoulder to shoulder like she promised me she would do with me is that I get honest about all my life and I still was not really all the way in. I really haven't been. But where that changed was I started to build this relationship with my sponsor when I started to sponsor because I I really, really want to practice humility, and I am really good at being a know-it-all, being the oldest of eight, and having five kids, and being a 15-year-old mom, and 17 years old as a wife. I knew it all. And I had a really bad attitude when it came to that ego and pride, and, and, and I was my nickname was Miss Know-it-all <laughs> for my parents and anybody else around me. And so, a way I did not want to feel, I didn't want to have that in my recovery, and I'm sure I go there with her, but she's just so loving, tolerant, and patient with me. <laughs> she, I think you should pray about that, Trisha. <laughs> she's so good at not telling me what to do. Like, she don't run my life, and I would just buck the system anyway. Well... I agree to disagree. I remember that one going, saying that one time to her. Um, <laughs> and let me tell you, <laughs> she was right. <laughs> she didn't say she was right when I came full circle in that problem. And uh, she did not say, I told you so, or see, you should have listened. She was just walked me right on through the, for, because of the incident, and I won't get into big detail. Um, she, we went right to prayer. And then she also explained to me what something she did at two years sober. And remind and, and so once again I felt part of, understood, loved, and guided. Um, because we looked at how I got into that situation and why and my character defects and we prayed about it. And then we had a plan of action to make that right. And so going through that is literally teaching me on what the steps are looking like. And I can't do that alone if I, I have to call her and ask for help. And boy, let me tell you, I was humiliated. Like I was sweating, I was crying, I was upset. And I gave another excuse of why I was calling her and really didn't even want to bring it up. But I just knew I was so uncomfortable. Like I literally got, got off a drunk. Like I was on an emotional hangover so physically ill from my behavior with my own mother um, that I was ashamed to have those words come out of my mouth. And you know what she ended the conversation with? You're feeling like that because you have a conscious contact with your God. Before, we would have excuses. We wouldn't tell anybody. We would have buts, because, and reasons. And I was like, huh. And, and once again, feeling that uh, gratitude of having someone guide me through this process that has been through it. And um, just a really strong example in my life of love, patience, and tolerance, and understanding. And God is always the answer. 
prayer is always the answer. It's not she has the answer. And, and that I've been able to exhibit with the women I help and work with, which is profound and Miss Know It All. It's like, you know what, let me call my sponsor. To me, I feel like that's just an act of humility. And even when I think I know, and I might have went through this with another person, but just to, I needed, I know I needed that practice to reach out to my sponsor. And, and, and there was something spiritual happening in our relationship and it just kept pushing me to call and call and double check and question and this is where we're at and this is what we're doing. Uh, Three-way calls. So, so I don't mix up the message and what you're sharing with me and then I go tell her and she don't get all the information. Can we all three, three do a phone call? And so I did a lot of those. And, and the coolest thing was I seen how that trickled that example of the example that she put before me, and then I was encouraged to do the same for my sponsee, and then she, the one that actually got through the 12 step, started doing the same thing. Is this right? And this is what we're doing? And I just wanted to make sure, I was like, wow, I see how this is working. We're all uh, helping and guiding each other, and um, it's just been a wonderful way of life, and I, I can literally sit here and talk all about the good stuff and um, all the challenges and, and really, really not challenges, just life, really. And, and the fact that I got Alcoholics Anonymous always, and if my sponsor isn't available, I got women in my network, uh, women that she sponsors that would carry the same message, you know. Um, and that was, of course, another aha moment for me because I always thought it was only my sponsor I had to call. And she says, no, there's other women I sponsor and they'll carry the same message. And, and you know, when I took that action and I was sitting at school in distress, I got the same directions, the same exact directions, the same love, the same encouragement, and the same guidance. Um, what I found is the more actions that I take in this process is the more that I receive spiritually. And, and before, I, I always thought it was, oh, I was going to get a good job and I was going to make lots of money and I'm going to buy a house and I'm going to have this and the perfect relationship and my kids are going to be back in my life. Well, I'm standing here before you with none of my kids in my life as in they're adopted. Um, but I have been blessed to be a part of my oldest daughter's life over the years uh, with my granddaughter and my middle son um, over the past year. I didn't think that was possible, but you know, leaving things up to God and doing what I'm supposed to, um, that relationship, found we, we were able to, it happened. And uh, boy, did I need a lot of help through that all the years missing and uh, just the whole thing all surrounding it um, always calling for help and praying and meditating and, and I can honestly say and, and even recently uh, I talk about doing an inventory often and not sure what it is I said or didn't say and how I'll come across when I share this with my sponsor but we're going to actually go through that again and she's going to give me some direction on that, some maybe clear, more clear, precise directions. Um, but for whatever much I know and whatever I think I know and the application that I have been applying, had it not been for that, I probably wouldn't be calling my sponsor. I wouldn't be praying because I see how much more I need God and my sponsor and other people in the program because uh, I see how I can fall short quite often and, and really put my foot in my mouth and, and do not exactly the best things. And I, I always thought that if I took out the alcohol and all the other things that I was just going to be white as snow and everything was going to be right. And I was like that because of the alcohol. Well, I had a rude awakening and that's not true and that's really why I need the step work. Um, I always say, the statement I say is um, this Actually applying and taking actions in my step work is a way out from Trisha. Because <laughs> I'm so selfish and self-centered that when I'm wrong or done wrong, I really beat myself up and really think low of myself. And the book clearly says that I constructively 
will review my day, and that I will not be become useful if I don't, if I just destruct, tear myself down, get in pity, I'm such a bad person, like as if I'm the worst thing in the world, and as if no other people have done this. Um, but it's only because of the steps and those directions and everything that uh, Susie had made sure that we, she read that book with me. And thank God, because like I said, my reading and comprehension is not the best. It has never been. Um, so I'm grateful that she walked through and pointed these certain things and some key words and, and what exactly are they telling me to do here? Um, when it told us to pray, when it came to the third step prayer, I'll never forget that. Third step prayer was in Starbucks. <laughs> and I was like, what? Here? No? She's like, well, we can go to the bathroom. I was like, no. <laughs> and I felt like instantly that some real change was going to happen for me. Like, I was not all, like, sure about this whole God thing. But when I really took that stand to get on my knees in public to, to have the sincere desire to do this step work and not try to run the show and, well, I'll, I'll do this and not that. And, you know, I see that that got me nowhere. And uh, I'm forever grateful um, to have the solid um, examples in my life. Um, these images just play on and on over when I'm out there in Fayetteville and I had all that time with home group members and sponsorship. I can literally play the tape in my mind and visually remember what exactly they did, that new face going to introduce myself. And I don't give my phone number. I get their phone number. And I actually call them as I was told to do. And, and, and the spirituality that grows with inside me that I'm not thinking about Trisha and how important my day was or how bad my day was, that I'm learning how to bring to the table and not like, I need a meeting. Um, yeah, that sounds like you need to call your sponsor. <laughs> and uh, I just, I really am grateful for a lot of uh, good orderly direction and, and guidance. Um, I probably keep repeating myself about that because it's really where I'm at. So I'm going to leave it with that since I am going over the same thing, so I'm grateful. I hope I didn't miss anything. I really don't even know what I said at this point. <laughs> I'm grateful to be here. I'm grateful to be sober, and I thank you guys for listening.